Hello, and welcome to Henry's Bookshelf, a podcast produced by the Henry Nowen Society. I'm Wendy Vanderwall Martin, and I'm so excited to bring you engaging and encouraging conversations about Henry Nowen's books that'll make you want to pick it up and read it again, or maybe read it for the very first time. And I'm thrilled to bring you these conversations from Henry's Library, housed here at the Cedars at Larche Daybreak. Welcome, friends, to a new episode of Henry's Bookshelf, produced by the Henry Nowen Society. Today, we're discussing Following Jesus. And the subtitle for this very important book is Finding Our Way Home in an Age of Anxiety. It was published in 2019, and Gabrielle Earnshaw was the editor. And she's currently working on the uh, official biography of Henry Nowen, which we're all very excited about. But part of the reason I'm having this conversation today is that this has been re-released with this beautiful new cover, but, you know, as nice as a new cover is, it actually also has a new, a new study guide at the back with wonderful reflective questions to really invite you to not just read with your mind, but to read with your heart and to really incorporate this into your life. This book was based on lectures that Henry gave in 1985 at a church in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, what better conversation to have with than with Robert Jonas, who met Henry in 1983 and was deep, deep soul friends with Henry now. Welcome, Jonas. Welcome. We're, we're thrilled to have you in this conversation. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Tell us about your, your meeting Henry and how that friendship developed. Okay, thank you. I, um, I was uh, in the middle of a doctoral program at Harvard uh, in psychology and education. And um, I heard about Henry preaching at the Harvard Divinity School. So, um, and I had just, I had gone through a divorce and had just mm -hmm. met Margaret. And Margaret was a Christian too, Episcopal. And we, so we marched over to Harvard Divinity School and we heard Henry speak and it changed both of us uh, because Henry was, his presence filled the hall really. Um, and it, you, you couldn't, I almost couldn't think on my own. It was like he was speaking to my soul and my soul was speaking. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was the, and I guess that was 82 or 83. I honestly, I can't remember. Um, but uh, that was the beginning of something e extraordinary. And then uh, I met Henry soon after that at uh, St. Paul's Church in Cambridge. And we went there for a talk and about 300 people were there. And it was, you know, again, extraordinary. It was so much energy in the room, in the basement of the, this big Catholic church. So I um, went up to Henry after, well, he ended his talk. And I was so enthralled with him that I, I went up to him first person in the line and I said, will you be my spiritual director? <laughs> so um, kind of taken aback and he said, I don't know, but um, let's have lunch. And so we had lunch in Harvard Square and that was the beginning of a friendship that lasted uh, un until he died really. And he lived with us the last year of his life. I mean, 1995. So yeah, it was it's a very it was a very dear friendship um, because my doctorate was in object relations psychotherapy. Uh, uh, he could talk to me about his family and some of his anxieties and so on. And um, because he was really my spiritual director, I could um, speak to him about the damage I experienced growing up in an alcoholic home and um, being in trouble with the law when I was young. I was I was arrested for breaking and entering when I was eleven, and uh, so I had I had a lot of work ahead of me to do, and uh, so that Henry and I could talk, um, and he could talk to me about being gay, and um, I had never had a gay friend, male friend before, so that relationship really opened up my world that um, I I 
the the screen that I grew up in in Wisconsin when I was uh, growing up there, the screen uh, really um, obfuscated the gay community altogether. And um, so he introduced me to another whole possibility of being a human being. And um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a little overview. Yes. I know we could spend the whole podcast simply talking about uh, the richness of that friendship. Yeah. Uh, I'll maybe do that another time. Okay. <laughs> now, as I mentioned already, the subtitle for this book is, is just... I actually read an excerpt of it this morning at, at another event oh. and said, based on the subtitle alone, it should be a bestseller, <laughs> Finding Our Way Home in an Age of Anxiety. Well, post-COVID, we're, we're just, anxiety is everywhere. Can you tell us a little bit about how you experienced Henry's approach to responding to anxiety, recognizing that that was a reality for himself as well. And with his classic vulnerability and authenticity in much of his writing, he's very honest about that and tell us, us about that. But Henry was this mix also of psychology and spirituality. And so how did you encounter him and this topic, this huge topic of anxiety? Yeah, 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 thank you. Um, uncertainty is a big word, but now of course uh, in this, culture that we're in things are changing so fast the internet means that things are out of date five minutes after we just learn about them um that's ex an extraordinary challenge and it does bring anxiety um so i i'm this is a subtopic but i've been very interested in what the internet is doing to our awareness mm -hmm. uh, for that reason and our understanding of what time is um henry in his life uh, and me now, I'm 77, have lived in a time when there was a certain predictability and, and rhythmic understanding of what time is and where time is going. We used to have seasons, for example. But in Wisconsin, where I grew up, um, the, the, uh, the snow came in uh, early October and it didn't leave and it would be this high and it wouldn't leave until, you know, April or so. And now last winter, they had to postpone all the snowmobile races in northern Wisconsin because there was no snow. It was all slush. So that uncertainty brings anxiety. Um, and uh, I've done, I mentioned to you earlier that I've done a lot of environmental work. I've been on the boards of land trusts and saving land. And uh, I live, I as much as I can, I live in nature. Um, we have land in Western Massachusetts. And um, I, I'm developing an understanding of... Um, Henry's insight about belovedness in a way that includes nature and includes the birds and the, the deer and the bear that are here and the bobcats and even the beavers, which I don't necessarily appreciate because they, they eat trees that I plant. So um, it's sometimes a bit of a battle, but, um, but there is that sense of beloved means that I'm in, um, and I guess I've gone a little bit beyond Henry in that sense. Um, I, I mentioned to you earlier that I, I did a video of Henry on creation. And um, that's just extremely important for me, that belovedness is not just about people. It's about the whole of creation, and including people, of course, uh, people we love, people we maybe hate, uh, but all of us are involved here. And um, we're, we're living in an interdependent universe um, in, in an uncertain time. And um, so I, I try to live that way with people and with nature. Um, I actually save land in perpetuity here in Massachusetts. You can do that. And um, this is maybe just a sidelight, but when I visited Henry so often in Richmond Hill, um, and, and I would I would stay in the little retreat center and uh, there'd be a bedroom nearby, um, I watched tremendous number hundreds and hundreds of houses gradually coming in and destroying all the surrounding um, nature of the especially the there were hundreds of acres of apple trees um, that were gradually destroyed over the 1980s 1990s when i would visit um, extraordinary pain for me to see that and the farmers having to move out and everything so the so belovedness his central message 
for me is is just expanded um beyond people and um uh, i actually put a uh, i made a video of henry speaking on creation um i found when i was writing my two books on on henry uh, i found 17 pretty good quotes about christ in nature and the com the communion between people and and creatures non-human creatures yes yeah. So to the anxious person. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. What, what did Henry say? Yeah. As someone who was often anxious himself. Yeah. <clears throat> um, as you mentioned, um, Henry lived in the psycho-spiritual world or the spirit-psycho world, whatever. Um, and so he was very mindful of personal, interpersonal anxiety um, and he, at the Menninger Institute, I think is wh where he was. And, um, and so this interpersonal anxiety, um, he connected from his, for example, from his father to father God. If we're talking about father for Christians, it's, uh, it's difficult for me a little bit because I saw my father beat up my mother when I was a kid. And then he left home altogether. Um, so father has always, always been uneasy with God as father. So Henry uh, um, actually I I felt that in the end, I saw Henry three months before he died. I visited him and um, he was at a different retreat center and, and uh, he seemed incredibly anxious. And um, I I could I could hug Henry as a heterosexual man with with a with a gay man. Um, we were comfortable hugging. So I remember sitting on a couch with him um, somewhere in Connecticut, and um, he he was so anxious he was almost shaking. And um, this was just a couple months before he died, three months maybe. Um, so I hugged him and I just listened to him and. Uh, he did talk about his father, but I didn't, because I had just been trained in psychotherapy, I, I, my ear was attuned to what about your father? And he, he told me that his father um, piled all his books in a corner of his room, his bedroom, and hadn't read any of them. Um, and, but he also, at the same time, he said his father, um, was very dear to him and he would visit his father once a year um and um i once went with henry to the retreat center where henry used to sometimes stay with his father um but i always felt honestly uh wendy that he was from a psychotherapeutic point of view that there was more work to be done and that his anxiety was about being unacceptable, not just um, culturally, um, but very deeply interpersonal connection with his dad. Um, I felt that there was a deep wound there and him being a gay man too. Um, and the Catholic church was telling him that he's disordered. So uh, his message of belovedness was just an arrow right in his into his heart right there. That's what he needed to hear. Um, but the um, that arrow of belovedness that, you know, there's so many images from the Catholic tradition of the arrow in the heart, um, that woundedness, um, the, the best he could do was the spiritual understanding of it, of that ultimately God is for me. God loves me no matter what. And I, I'm the beloved and I'm listening to that every moment of my life. And then, there's that um, happening at the same time as him feeling he's not, he'll never be good enough. And his, his father didn't completely, it didn't understand him, didn't understand him. Um, and so both are true. Mm -hmm. he, he felt completely healed. Uh, and yet there was this anxiety that was not healed. Um, at least the few couple months before he died. Mm -hmm. 
I'd like to share a, a quote from the book, Following Jesus, that speaks exactly to what Jonas was just telling us. Henry says this, the first love says this, I loved you before you could love anyone or before you could receive love from anyone. I have accepted you. You are accepted. You are loved no matter what mother, father, brother, sister, school, church, society does. You are born out of my love. I have breathed you out of my love. I have spoken you out of my love. You are the incarnation of my love. And in me, there is no hatred. There is no revenge. There is no resentment. There is nothing that wants to reject you. I love you. Can you trust that love? Mm -hmm. The original love is the original blessing. The original love is the original acceptance. Long before we talk about original sin or original rejection, we should speak about God's original love. Yeah. One of my professors used to say, preachers must always preach larger than their own lives. <laughs> and it seems to me that Henry spoke larger than his own life. He wrote larger than his own life. And, and so many of us have found this profound gift of healing through Henry's words. And yet, as you've described, there was this push-pull for Henry to experientially know that in a sustainable and consistent way. Um, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I think eventually, can I add something here? I think, no, I, I'm glad you, that's a great quote. I love it. And it, it's true. The first love, original love, um, those phrases and where they're pointing in me were, have been, were transformative when I was with him. Absolutely. And still, you know, I'm like Henry, I have got the, these two things are going on where I'm, I'm completely acceptable, 100%, 100%. And yet there's these, uh, this anxieties that arise out of the past, out of the basement of the unconscious, things I didn't, I, I was not aware of. Um, some of the damage I experienced in my ch childhood, I, I didn't become aware of until my 50s, 60s, um, with a fair amount of psychotherapy around along the way, you know. So I, I've really needed to hear, not only, I heard those words from Henry directly to me. Um, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, in 1993, um, Margaret and I were really hoping we could have another child. We had had one child, Sam, who's now 35 years old. But um, so we went through IVF stuff and we went through all the possibilities to make another child possible and and then uh we finally had rebecca came to us in in boston at a hospital there and um rebecca was born early two months or maybe even three months early not sure um and she died in my arms um while margaret was recovering and uh i think no they brought margaret in from the operating room. so we went home devastated and um I called Henry. Henry was in um, England. He was giving a talk, and um, I, I told him what had happened. And he said, "I'm I'm coming." He said, "I'll be there," and he was. And he landed at Logan Airport, and I picked him up, and he came to our house, and he he spent, I think, a couple of days at our house. And as I spoke about losing Rebecca, um, and he listened, uh, and we he. The key thing he said was, you know, Jonas, and he called me Jonas, uh, Jonas, um, um, G Jesus lost Rebecca too. And uh, and I felt like um, that was another one of those arrows, the divine arrows into my heart, that of Jesus on the cross. He connected Jesus on the cross to the experience, the deep grief that I was experiencing that I'm participating in Christ's life and death. Mm -hmm. It's not just my experience. 
and that was another that was another way that he could not bypass the ego work that we have to do but to um to to merge them in a way to that yes that deep personal loss is is just personal in this linear time world but there's also an infinite dimension which is um um Christ on the cross so that ever since that time uh, that that happened in the early 90s i um whenever i'm in deep anxiety or loss um or self disregard whatever i um i i i come to that image of christ on the cross and henry being with me saying jesus lost rebecca too mm. Mm. thank you for sharing such a precious story what what a what a profoundly painful deposit of what is deeply true yeah yeah now i have read your words saying that henry reintroduced you to jesus yeah and and you had a one might say a bit of an eclectic spiritual journey yeah Tell us about re-encountering Jesus as you met Henry. Okay. So uh, my grandparents took me and my two siblings in when my parents became too alcoholic to do, do a good job of parenting. And my grandparents, the Redens family, um, were German Lutheran. And they would go to church in a German-speaking church, um, Lutheran church. And grandma had images of Jesus all over the house that I didn't know at the time, but I don't have one with me, but they were painted by Werner Salman. They were painted in the thirties and forties by Werner Salman. Um, but when I was, but when I was young, these images of Jesus were like, um, like heaven on earth. They, they were like mm -hmm. photographs. I thought, Oh, that's actually how Jesus looks. You know, I mean, I didn't think that, but that, that this this is the Jesus who's with me, even when there's violence in the home, even when there's alcoholism and I, I'm in trouble with it, what law, whatever. Jesus is always with me. Um, but then I found in my twenties, I, I found out that Warner Salmon painted those images, mm -hmm. and he was a he was a businessman, you know, an artist businessman. So I, um, like, oh, that's not what Jesus looks like. So then. That in my twenties, that became a an um, uh, an uh, um, how can I say uh, an invitation to um, see what's the world like without Jesus. Oh. Okay, so then I I was introduced to um, Buddhism. I was an undergraduate. I uh, I was an undergraduate at Dartmouth, and um, Dartmouth is not a especially religious place to be as a um uh very secular or uh, college um so i um i lost touch with jesus mm -hmm. and i stopped going to church and um uh, but in my reading on the side i found thomas merton um roman catholic not lutheran so that was a new world but i had been um at dartmouth i was uh learning karate um, from a Chan master, which is a Chinese Zen Buddhism. And um, so Thomas Merton is saying, oh, no worries. You could, you can learn from Buddhism and still be deep, deeply um, living a deep life with Jesus. So I read a lot of, of Merton's books. And then in the 90s, uh, these are transformations of Jesus, you know, it's like Jesus changes form um, over the years for me. So there was the original Lutheran Jesus, Warner Salmon, and then there's Thomas Merton's um, Jesus. And then I I was divorced once. My first wife was Roman Catholic. And so, And in the marriage, I decided I'm going to go to a Roman Catholic church. I did, and I enjoyed it. And then I went to a monastery and I became a third order Carmelite. So then was St. John of the Cross. 
and St. John of the Cross was um, uh, a margin, uh, not marginalizing. He he was a boundary figure be be for me because with Christianity and Buddhism, because he was both in the I Thou dimension of Jesus, which I knew about, I experienced, but he was also into letting everything go, even mm -hmm. images of Jesus, whether it's in Warner Salmon image or a Catholic image or a Lutheran image, that Jesus is not the image. Jesus is at a deeper level of experience. Um, and and so as a Carmelite uh, and third order Carmelite, I um, I read all of St. John the Cross's works and got totally into him. And then, um, and then I couldn't support my family as a farmer. I was a farmer and back to land farmer. So I applied to and was accepted at Harvard. Um, and that's where I met Henry. So, and, and there's Henry's Jesus, you know, which I like very much. Um, the beloved one uh, who was here before I was born. So that Jesus, you know, it was just like these changing forms of Jesus over the years. And I, I think that a lot of people must experience that, you know, as we age, um, our sensibilities change, our, our receptors change, uh, spiritual receptors, psychological receptors. Mm -hmm. uh, who really is a transformative presence? And that's what I'm most, most interested in. And um, yeah, Henry bump, bumped me across to another dimension, <laughs> another Jesus. And I will say, uh, if you, like Jonas, have some evolving transfigurations of Jesus, Henry might leave you surprised in his book, Following Jesus, that there is uh, both this deep Christ-centeredness and this generous space yes. in, in which to encounter yes. your belovedness. So now, how, how is it that you think Henry's message, given that he he was a lover of Jesus, <laughs> you know, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, yeah. and yet I know so often we hear his heart to speak to to people beyond religion and the the, the restrictions, perhaps, of religion, yeah. and so what of Henry's message do you think? speaks to spiritual seekers, perhaps even those who've experienced some trauma by institutions, but in the name of Jesus. Mm, yes, right. And I guess we'd have to include Henry in that category, some trauma from the institution, because he was very aware of this word disordered because he was gay coming out of the Vatican. He told me they was never invited by the Vatican to anything. Um, so he had no connection to the, uh, the power center of the church. He was, he was marginalized by his own church. Um, as so, a sidebar, Jonas, you pardon? might, as a sidebar, you might get a chuckle out of this, but in April, I went to the Vatican Oh, and there in the bookstore, Henry Nowen, and it's a tiny little bookstore. It's not very big. And I thought, wow, Henry has a, a clear place, a clear name in the yeah. Vatican bookstore. So. <laughs> yes. Ho hoorah. <laughs> My dad was a Marine. Hoorah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's beautiful. It's I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, he, yes, he, um, he loved the liturgies and he did such an incredible job of presencing Jesus in the liturgy, in the communion service, and um, and you know having um, folks from the large community be at the table, so and folks of color being at the table with folks of white uh, white white folks, so yeah, there was a sense of boundarylessness about the love that I think he he did manifest, um, and then his he had a you know a, a sort of a, a very short relationship with Eknas Eknath. Esfaran, uh, a Hindu te uh, meditation teacher, and I think it says in the introduction to this book that uh, that Henry suggested that Richard Rohr visit Esfaran, and uh, that's just another example of 
he's 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 out of this he's out of the box henry henry's out of the box and he's looking for connections but there's the one thing that he would never agree to in my conversations with him because i i there were periods in our friendship when i was very buddhist um and i thought wow this is amazing just to be able to dwell in silence and let when we're speaking about anxiety let anxiety arise let fear arise let love arise and um, hope. Let everything arise. Um, don't don't say no to anything. Um, that really helped me instead of, like, I think what I was doing previously um, before I encountered Buddhism was I'd say, oh, that's wrong to feel that, or that's not as good as this, or that I'd have preferences to what I felt and what I thought. But Buddhism cured me of that. Um, well, almost. I'm, I'm not cured, <laughs> but I mean, I'm doing better. Um, to allow things to arise without judgment. And uh, Henry was that way too, but but there was more for, for him. And this is something Buddhism doesn't do very well, which is the I-thou dimension. I mentioned the, sec the second person of the Trinity um, in, in, this, in this book. I have to show this book. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, this, so I just finished this book now two years ago, but it's, it locates Henry within the Trinity as the, the spokesperson in my life for the second person of the Trinity, which is the I-thou dimension. Now in Buddhism, you don't have, have so much of the I-thou. Uh, it's quite in a sense impersonal because everything is arising and disappearing. Impermanence is one of the basic teachings. It's And, and so that's a beautiful thing, but I, I need to love and I need to be loved. <laughs> and they don't do that in, in Burma or um, India a little bit, not so much in Korea or or in uh, Japan. But I discovered Japanese flute when I went, I, I left my doctoral program at Harvard. I mean, I completed it, but then I, a few years later after doing psychotherapy, I went to Western Jesuit School of Theology for another ma a postdoc master's. And while I was there, a teaching fellow got up and he played the shakuhachi, Japanese bamboo flute. And so I started playing for, for about a dozen or 12 years. I, I play the shakuhachi and I did three albums and I would introduce the Japanese Zen tradition. But I'd always say, there's one thing you're not going to find in Zen Buddhism, which is this I thou love the, and the belovedness love that, that Henry gave us. I mean, re-gave us after Jesus. Um, so... Um, these two dimensions of East-West spirituality, Henry, if he had lived longer, he and I, I, you know, I miss the conversations. I think we would have had some really great conversations about this, this first person divine openness and the love, the original love, the first love, um, the different words we can use for all this. But I would say, and you know, for all the folks listening in, like um, be, be patient as you grow in in christ because different teachers will show up and ins insights will deepen and and get diverted off some other way but if you're patient um christ will never will never disappear and will always just change don't worry about changing the form um, but the love is the same love it's the original love thank you henry <laughs> Jonas, I can't help but think of Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, which Henry wouldn't have read because it, it, it Eugene finished it after Henry's death. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, normally we would know this as the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Eugene Peterson says, uh, the word took on flesh and moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> and so, you know, in, in this book, where Henry's speaking about following Jesus, it's it's a very embodied, relational, present yes. connection yes. with the love that makes us the beloved. And so yes. uh, we're all incarnations in that sense. Yes, yes. Uh, later on in the book, Henry is sharing about a time when he was extremely depressed and he happened to be in Flagstaff, Arizona. And he decided to go and visit the Grand Canyon. 
Uh, and this is how he described it. <laughs> Looking at the Grand Canyon, at that enormous abyss of beauty, the strange depression fell away. I felt the silence. In the face of this natural wonder, I thought, what are you worrying about? As if you are carrying the burden of the world, a world that survived before you and is something that will go on a long time after you. Why don't you just enjoy your life and really live it? This image of the Grand Canyon stayed with me for a long time. God is like the Grand Canyon. Oh. God suffered the wound, the wound of all humanity. And if I enter in the presence of that wound, my wound becomes a light burden or a light pain. Not because it is not there, but because it has been embraced by love. I can live my pain and not be destroyed by it. Mm. I can acknowledge my pain and not be paralyzed by it. The Grand Canyon invited me to enter an abyss of divine love and to experience that I am immensely loved and cared for. I was invited to enter life with a new heart, with God's heart. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Now, Henry had this amazing mystical capacity to see. It, through his, his writing, we see how art captivated him. We see at times he was just completely blown away by things in the natural world. Um, how did Henry understand that gift in himself? Did he view himself as a mystic? Or did he see that he was called to be more of a pastor or a teacher writer? How did he connect to his own, uh, the gift of his own mysticism? I don't think I ever heard him yeah. use that word, uh, mystic or mysticism. Um, it's, which could be valuable that he didn't, or maybe not. I'm not sure because it's a misunderstood word. Um, people don't think, you know, if you're mystic, that means you're special in some way. You're not an ordinary person anymore. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I guess I would describe me as a mystic because I, I believe that this invisible presence is um, is holding up my life. It's where I come from, and um, it's who I am. And so, um, mystic is okay with me. But Henry didn't. He he wrote over and over. I was just looking at this book this morning, and he wrote over and over again about how he wasn't special, and it was a temptation to be special in some way. And um, so he, he he just wanted to tell the truth, but it turns out his truth is not an everyday truth, you know, and it, it, some people would put that in the mystical dimension because it's an invisible transformative truth that, that, that we're, we're never alone. We're always in this presence. And, um, and even so, I mean, there, I, I just want to bring out the Herman human side of Henry just a bit here because um, I, I've, <clears throat> I've been hosting a, a contemplative retreat center for 30 years, um, started in 1994 in uh, Cambridge area, Massachusetts. And when Henry would come to visit us, he would sometimes come to the Sunday morning Empty Bell contemplative group, where we start with 20 minutes of silence, then we read the scriptures for the day, and then, and then we have sharing and so on. And um, one of the things I noticed is that Henry was very, almost always, uneasy in the silence. You know, sitting on a cushion, doing nothing. I, I could feel like he was, you know, with their, this energy wanted to come out. And uh, he'd rather preach than sit in silence. But the, the, the weird thing is that he said such extraordinary, beautiful things about silence. <laughs> um, uh, and yet it was difficult for him. Um, so um, he was a, a normal person in the sense that he was complicated and we're all complicated. <laughs> so um, 
but he was also, I would say, yeah, he was a, definitely a mystic because there's a deeper dimension here that is invisible to ordinary eye, uh, invisible to our sensitivity, to our, our living in linear time. There's another time. And the, the time that I, when I lead retreats, I, uh, I borrow from the Catholic tradition to, to make the sign of the cross that we're living in this dimension and we're also living in this dimension. This dimension is eternal. This dimension is linear time. We're born and we die. And, and that, that was the, uh, the, you probably remember uh, when he went to the crystal cathedral uh, and he spoke in the crystal cathedral, he talked about that, that we're living in these two dimensions. And that is, that is really a transformative sermon to see. And it, it's out there on YouTube now. Um, yes. It's on the Henry Nowen website. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes. Uh, on our YouTube channel. Oh, that's great. When Henry gave that talk, I think it was 1980, let me think, 1993. Um, and he was one of the few Catholic preachers at this very famous Crystal Cathedral. Um, but he was loved by the people. And it, that... I, I watch that video probably once a year, ever since 1996, ever since he died. And I show it to everybody as an introduction to what the Christian faith is all about. Um, this eternal and linear. And we're, we're in both worlds. We're in both worlds always. It is such a gift to be able to speak with you who knew Henry so well. Um, in these podcasts, I try to give Henry the last word yeah, good. from the book that we're featuring. And, and I chose this portion to end with today. Henry Nowen says, following Jesus means following the risen Lord. Following Jesus means following the Lord who is the Lord of history, the Lord who is with us now and here at this moment, it's not a sentimental memory. It's not a pious feeling about somebody we hardly know. No, it is being guided by the one who is with us here and now. It is being led by the one who is really present among us as the Lord, who rose from the dead, and became the Lord who embraces all people in all times and is therefore the Lord of the now, the present, the here. Mm. And now in following Jesus. Robert Jonas, it's been a delight. We're going to have all of your contact information, websites, videos in the show notes of this podcast episode. And to you, our listeners, thank you so very much for being with us. Mm. And never ever forget that you are the beloved of God. If you enjoyed this episode of Henry's Bookshelf, a podcast produced by the Henry Nowen Society, then leave us a review or a thumbs up, share it with family and friends, subscribe to our YouTube channel or another podcast platform, and head over to henrynowen.org. Sign up for our free daily meditations or consider giving us a donation that would help support programs like this one to share the spiritual wisdom of Henry Nowen right around the world. Thanks so much for being with us.